So in the last videos, we were talking about the different types of lava, different types of eruptions, and then different types of volcanoes associated with those eruptions and lava. Now, whenever these things actually happen, eventually you're actually going to get to the point that the rocks are going to solidify and form new changes to the crust. So then comes the idea of volcanoes have massive land mass building things. And these pieces of rock, which were not there before, but are now new pieces of the crust, are called magma intrusions. And the largest one of these magma intrusions, especially the ones which are visible to the outside, are called plutons, like this one that you see here, which is the remnants of the middle of a volcano. And probably the material of the inside of the volcano was tougher than the outside, and so the, while the outside got eroded, the middle did not, and you were left with this cool little pattern that you see there. And we'll talk more about that in, later, so uh, we'll come back to this picture to talk more about it. But the basic things that you will see in magma intrusions or are basically large uh, changes to the crust because of that. So large changes are called plutons, okay? And one biggest example of that is a batholith. Now, a batholith will be basically a large magma chamber that basically solidified and maybe later on got uplifted or all the other rock that was around it got eroded and then you get a batholith. A perfect example of a batholith is a lava plateau because that gets uplifted and forms in the surface, right? And But this could also happen if all the rock that's above it happens to erode, leaving just the batholith behind. That is possible. Uh, but normally, batholiths are exposed by uplifting. Now, remember that those sideway incursions that we talked about, it's called sills. The vertical intrusions, which are actually usually like kind of an angle, are called dikes. Uh, when those things actually hit the surface, we call them flows. If they never hit the surface, but kind of gather in a magma chamber close to the surface, but smaller than a batholith, we call them lacrolyphs, or, all right? Small batholiths are also called stalks sometimes, okay? So something that's not as big as a larva plateau, okay? It's not, so it'll be a batholith kind of small than this. You also have the volcanic cone itself. It's, in a way, an intrusion of rock, especially the middle of it, which has a neck, and it has its own dikes and sills. All of those things are going to be built basically on magma intrusions. Now, the cone itself may be made of volcanic materials, such as, for example, pyroclastic materials in the case of a cinder cone, or lava itself, uh, in the case of the shield volcano, but sometimes in the composite volcanoes, it is, it is actually mountains that were there before, folded rock from a long time ago. But it's also, might be, uh, oscillating layers of lava and pyroclastic materials. So the cone itself is an example of volcanic landforms, all right? But the most common type of magma intrusions, which are pieces of lava that are not actually exposed to the surface, are called dikes, sills, stocks, or batholiths, and then lacrolyphs. Notice that. Sills and dikes, lacrolyphs and batholiths are always underground, right? Because the dikes are the vertical things that never really reach the surface. The sills are the lateral things. The lacrolyphs are, are small batholiths near the surface, and then the batholiths are the large magma chambers underneath, which, when, if smaller, are called stocks. And the biggest difference between intrusion and extrusion is that intrusion never hits the surface. It never truly becomes lava. It is just magma that solidifies before ever reaching the surface. Now, it is possible for intrusive rocks to actually become exposed after they form. So, think about it all the way it was before, right? So, you have the, the magma and you have the magma chamber, which could become later on a batholith, right? And you have your dikes, you have, which are those little... Uh, angular canals or side uh, the pipes and then you have the lateral canals we're called sills right you see all of that there and sometimes you actually have lava flows volcanic cones and all that stuff but those are extrusive intrusive things are the ones you see in the bottom now if that solidifies and the volcano dies after a long period of time you might stay leave behind those pieces of dikes and sills and everything else that you saw before and including the volcanic neck, which was the middle of the of volcano. So if you erode some of that rock, you're going to expose things like, for example, the volcanic neck, like we saw in the previous picture. The, vo the volcanic cone was eroded, leaving behind only the tougher material that was made of lava and left that behind. Also, you eroded off the top, but the dike was left behind. So you see the dike left behind there. And maybe you might also leave behind the sills if this all of this rock were to get eroded, 
then the sill and more dikes will become exposed. And if, if uplift and erosion continue, you can actually get to expose the actual batholift if you actually erode to deep, deep levels over long, long periods of time, or if the batholift somehow gets uh, uplifted, right? So volcanic uh, er erosion of volcanic materials can actually expose rock. Now, even though not featured in the screen, these rocks can also become exposed if they are ejected. So let's say you have a dike that forms and solidifies, and then because of a magma activity, a piece of rock that formed from a previous eruption and already solidified gets thrown out by a volcanic eruption out into the open. Now, that rock will then be exposed. So sometimes volcanic ejections expose intrusive rocks from previous uh, periods. And sometimes, because of um, magma movement and earthquakes shattering the surface of the earth, you might actually expose deeper levels of the earth and expose intrusive rocks as well. But by definition, intrusive rocks are rocks that form through magma. It never really was lava. It never was exposed to the surface until erosion, earthquakes, and magma motion, or uplift, or volcanic ejections actually expose those rocks to the surface. Then you have magma extrusions, which is when magma actually seeps to the surface to become lava. Volcanic necks are kind of toss up between the two of them because in a way volcanic necks are, were exposed because they were in the middle, like they were the, inside a caldera, so they were kind of touching the air. But some people consider intrusive because just the top was exposed and bottom was not. So in a way, it's kind of like in between the two of them, all right? So, that's what we're talking about here. You see the volcanic knack that I told you we we're going to come back to. There used to be a large cone surrounding this, but the cone got eroded and left behind the neck and the pieces of the magma chamber. And you see all the lava domes that you get on the sides. And you even see some of those dikes and sills along the surface as well. And that is what you left behind because the lava was clearly made of harder material than the cone was made of. And the cone was eroded first. Maybe the cone was very pyroclastic, very ashy, very easy to erode, but the magma was more tough and harder to erode. And so that's why it didn't actually survive longer, right? Another example of magma extrusions is lava plateaus or dome mountains. And you see those things feature over here. Dome mountains and lava plateaus were actually formed by the magma seeping through the surface and actually for pushing the higher and higher and solidifying as it goes up. And so those are examples of extrusions as well. You also have lava flows like Pahoe Hoi and AA lava, which as they flow, they actually solidify to form rock. That's another example of extrusive volcanic rock. You also have dome lava domes, which are basically the material that's inside the, the crater or the caldera, and sometimes it pushes higher. Like, for example, I told you guys that in the middle of the Yellowstone Park, there's a large mountain that's basically a lava dome. Now, if that magmativity subsequently stops and that dome solidifies, sometimes that dome basically becomes exposed to the surface, and that's considered extrusive rocks as well. And then you also have lava deposits, which are basically when pyroclastic material gathers over long, long periods of time and forms a kind of sedimentary rock that's basically... Igneous, though, because it's really pyroclastic material gathered into layers. And this is going to be common whenever you have those large igneous provinces all around the world, in places like Iceland, South America, uh, Southern Plates, which is an old, now inactive igneous province. You have a Siberian igneous province as well. You have the large igneous province in, near Ethiopia, where the, around... And then you have Yellowstone Park as well. So whenever you have these large volcanic hotspots or large volcanoes is spilling a lot of volcanic paraclastic materials, you're going to have lava deposits forming as well. All right? So the biggest difference, again, between intrusions and extrusions is extrusions is any kind of rock that forms from materials coming from volcanoes that actually got exposed to the surface, like the neck, which is made of the caldera material, or the lava dome, similar idea, plateaus and dome mountains, or lava deposits or lava flows and intrusions are going to be pieces of rock that never really was exposed until they became rock and that's dikes, sills, stocks or batholiths or lacrolyphs which might then subsequently become exposed by magma movements, volcanic ejections, volcanic erosion of volcanic materials and uplift of the crust as well. All right.
on our next video, we're going to be talking about igneous rocks and the different characteristics of igneous rocks. Okay, I'll see you guys then.